I talked to students yesterday a little bit about stress and all what's going on with uh, Canvas. And uh, some teachers are piling on work, others are not. Obviously, I'm not that teacher. <laughs> right? So really, you haven't had any stress from my class. Hopefully, uh, with this, this thing we're doing right here, uh, you're learning and you don't have to stress about it, okay? But um, we're going to finish this today, and I, I won't have time to explain it. So next, uh, well, on Monday, will you guys be here Monday? Not here, right? So that's going to be an important video to watch because uh, I'm going to explain what all this means for you as an individual, depending on how many yeses and nos you have up here. Okay. So if you got some catching up to do, catching up to do on the videos, uh, to know you know what all these things mean, all these different issues, uh, the background on. Them. Uh, today, we're going to start with number uh, 19, okay, which would be support a constitutional amendment defining marriage as one man and one woman, okay? Now, obviously, guys, when they wrote uh, the Constitution, um, marriage was just something that was normally one man and one woman, right? I mean, that's, and that's been kind of the tradition in this country for close to 200 years until 2003 when Massachusetts was the first state to legalize marriage between same-sex couples, okay? It's 2003, okay? In 2015, this case, Oberfell versus Hodges, that's when the Supreme Court ruled that uh, the 14th Amendment, and I talked about the 14th Amendment that first week, which gives equal protection under the law to all citizens. They use that to create the gay marriage right, basically. Okay? It's not in the Constitution, obviously, but the Supreme Court, it was a five to four decision, okay? Uh, five of them saying, yes, this right is included in the 14th Amendment, okay? I mean, really, it's not. They created it, okay? Now, guys, the way our system was set up is that this, Massachusetts, allowing for gay marriage in their state, is within their purview. I mean, so we get to elect the leaders of our state, and if those leaders choose to do something like that, then that's, that's the people decide. When you talk about the Supreme Court, it's nine people nine people. They're deciding for everybody. That's not the way, that's not the way our system was set up. Okay? And so I was reading this morning what is called the dissenting opinion to four justices that disagreed with the majority. And that's what they were talking about. This is a decision to be made by states, not by the Supreme Court. Okay? Now, guys, so we're not going back on this. I mean, it's not like this case is going to get overturned. Um, gay marriage is here to stay. So it, really the only way you could create marriage just between one man and one woman would be to pass a constitutional amendment. Okay? Constitutional amendments are very difficult to pass. We have had 27 in American history, 17 outside of the Bill of Rights, Okay, it takes two thirds of both houses of Congress to propose an amendment, and three quarters of the states, or 38 states, to ratify an amendment. It's very difficult to do. Okay, so I don't see this happening. The question is whether you support it. Okay, now you guys haven't been in you know religious classes and so forth over the years. Uh, know some you know some of the arguments on this. Um, but I want to talk about the law and what happened in America in just the last 20 years with this, okay? So Massachusetts, then Hawaii, okay? Hawaii uh, passed gay marriage, okay? And then there, uh, I don't know, 
maybe Cal California might have been the third, okay? So you have these states that have gay marriage, and most of the states don't. You follow me? So like Kansas, in our state constitution, we put in there that marriage is between one man and one woman, okay? But there's something in the constitution called the full faith and credit clause. States are the ones that issue marriage licenses. Yes? States are the ones that issue driver's licenses. Now, you can use this Kansas driver's license in any of the other 49 states. Am I right? Yes? You can drive all over the country. Yes? In fact, if you go to Europe, you want to rent a car, they're going to want to see your driver's license from the United States. Okay? So, I mean, these things are good. Other states have to recognize these licenses. Okay? The full faith and credit clause says so. So, this is where we started running into problems back in 2003 was, well, if, if Kansas has to recognize Massachusetts driver's license, do we not have to recognize their marriage licenses of gay couples? You follow me? So the U.S. Congress passed something called the Defense of Marriage Act. Act. Defense of Marriage Act, which said Kansas did not have to recognize Massachusetts gay marriage. Now, does, does a law, this defense, does this law, override the Constitution. Which is more powerful, a law passed by Congress or the Constitution? The Constitution is the supreme law of the land, okay? However, even though Congress passed this, this was unconstitutional, okay? It was unconstitutional because of the full faith and credit clause. But the court didn't overturn this law Okay, until 2013. Okay, and then the Supreme Court passed, you know, with this decision, said gay marriage is a right found in the 14th Amendment, which they just made up. You know, I mean, they just created that. Okay, so the, the, what I'm talking about here is not so much gay marriage, but the law and the Constitution and how our system functions, okay? You'll understand that better as we move along uh, and get into how the Constitution works. Um, but just on a, on a thought process here, how do you feel about gay marriage? Do you think that, um, do you think that, uh, I got somebody here, Brian's in. I want to pin me. Okay. That's weird. Okay. Um, if, if you thought it were possible, would you support a constitutional amendment that would define marriage as one man, one woman? Okay. That's just, it's not likely. Okay. 30 years ago, maybe. But today, probably not. Okay. Good. Moving on, post the Title IX. Now, the first day I started talking, the first thing we did was affirmative action. And affirmative action was created in 1964. Remember that? That was to uh, help minorities and going to school, colleges, uh, minorities getting jobs, uh, and uh, for government contracts, okay? Title IX is part of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Have any of you guys ever heard of this, Title IX? Okay. Uh, let's see. Do we have any female athletes in here? What do you do? Track. Track. Cross country. What? Soccer. Softball. Okay, so. Are any of you guys going to try and play in college, ladies? Okay. All right. So this deals with scholarships. 
uh, at our universities, okay, and facilities, sports facilities, okay. Title IX says that there needs to be an equal number of athletic scholarships for men and women. Sports. Okay. Now, this really got and started being enforced in the late 80s. Okay, even though it was passed in 1964, they weren't really enforcing this. So let me give you an example. If we build a new fence for the baseball field, okay, we have to build a new fence for the softball field. Does that make sense? Um, so it's with facilities, but also scholarships. Okay, so when you get to college, okay, there's one big problem with this, and it's called college football. Okay. What is the biggest revenue producer in for colleges in sport? Football. Okay. Now, if you're a KU, basketball probably brings in more than football. Although I don't know. I mean, it depends on how many people show up for the football game. In some years, a lot of people show up for the football games at KU. Some years they don't. Okay. They're traditionally really bad. Yes. Okay. But, I mean, that, there was that one year they won the Orange Bowl, okay? And I'm sure the stands were packed. I think they went like 10 and 1 or 11 and 1, okay? And then they fired the coach because he was too mean, okay, to the players. Mark Mangino, big, heavy guy, okay? But anyhow, uh, college football, if you're going to go to the university or K State University, and have college football. It's a major program, okay? Do you know how many scholarships they have for their football team? Full scholarships? 85. 85, okay? It's a big revenue producer. They have a lot of scholarships. Now, is there any other sport, male or female, that has that many team members? No, they don't have that many players, right? Now, track teams, I know at Wichita State, there's 60 spots for the men, 60 spots for the women, okay? Um, so you're, you're getting close with women's track, but you also have men's track that offsets that. So there's no other female sport comparable to football. So when you're trying to create the equal number of scholarships, you got to do one of two things because you're starting with 85 for the men, okay? So you either got to cut other male sports scholarships or add female sports to offset football. So like at KU, if you're a pretty good athlete and you're the right size, strong, you can get a scholarship for women's rowing. We've had girls from this school that have gotten scholarships to row, you know, rowing, a boat, at KU. Okay, and um, I mean, that's that's like, that's paying for your school. Do they have men's rowing at KU? No. Okay, do they have women's soccer at KU? They have it at K-State. We know that. They have it at K-State, but they don't have men's soccer. You follow me? So... The biggest victims of Title IX have been men's sports, more, most specifically men's wrestling and college baseball. Okay, you, you guys heard Northern Iowa. They used to be in the Missouri Valley with Wichita State, Northern Iowa University. They dropped their baseball program about seven years ago, okay, because of Title IX. Once upon a time, we used to have a wrestling coach here named Mark Stovall. I think he probably coached some of your brothers, and he's a great coach. Uh, if you go back and look at the state titles for wrestling at Bishop Carroll, he's got it. He had like three or four of them, okay, and then one right after the year he left. So he kind of gets part of that one too. Stovall's down at uh, he's in Houston at Trinity. Um, I think it's Trinity. Uh, no, it's Jesuit in Houston. Jesuit, 
got to this Catholic school, I mean, it's like $20,000 to go to. I mean, it's like a super rich school. So he's the, he's a dean, assistant dean, and head wrestling coach. The first year they went, he went down there as a wrestling coach. They had already planned the trip before he got there to take the wrestling team to Europe to wrestle. He's been trying to get his team up here to wrestle in our in our tournament. Uh, that may happen this year because Kent, his boy, uh, they used to be my neighbor too in Stovall. So, uh, anyhow, Stovall was a Division One wrestler at LSU. Okay, and he came back for his junior year, and they held a meeting, and they informed all the wrestlers at LSU that they regret to tell them that they're shutting down the wrestling. Because of Title IX. Okay. Now, Title IX has been awesome for women. Okay. It's been great for women. Okay. And if you look at the results of Title IX, you can see it every four years in the Olympics. Okay. The most dominant team in the world in the Olympics, especially in the Summer Olympics, but also in the Winter Olympics quite often, is the U.S. women's team. We dominate, okay? We, the women's American team scores more points than any other country in the world for any team, okay? So women's athletics in the United States has really grown, and it gives girls uh, an opportunity after high school to, you know, continue their playing careers, okay? Which prior to Title IX, I mean, Guys, the fact is, most college athletics lose money. You don't put enough fans in the seat. Now, if you look at Wichita State women's volleyball, they're in the top 15 of attendance in the country. So they're putting enough butts in the seat to pay for the girls' uniforms, their travel, all this. But if you take 60 track athletes and you fly them down to Florida for a conference meet, that's freaking expensive. They don't recoup that money through like attendance and stuff. You know what I mean? It costs more money. Wichita State has a really good track team. Okay? They have a great program. Um, but still, they lose money. Wichita State baseball used to be in the top in attendance in the country when they were really good. You go back to the late 80s when they won the World Series and they were going to the World Series, you know, for a few years in a row. I mean, there was, you know, thousands of people there paying money to go, and it paid for the program, okay? Now you go, I mean, hopefully under the new management, under, you know, the new coach, uh, Wichita State Baseball is going to be improving. I think they will. Um, but anyhow, you guys kind of see how this works? Now, in a perfect world, if you, took, if you took football out of the equation, obviously Wichita State doesn't have football, okay? If you took football out of the equation and then gave equal scholarships to men and women, that might be a little better, but it's not a perfect world. Okay, so men tend to get the short end of the stick. Let me give you an example. Jackson, say you want to play college baseball and you want to go to Emporia State. Emporia State has five and a half scholarships for baseball. Five and a half. Between 35 players. That's, I mean, now softball, they get more than that. Okay, and they need fewer players because softball pitchers, right, can throw all day. Well, not all day. But they can throw a lot more than big. I mean, you need 12 pitchers, 13 pitchers for a college baseball team. How many you need for a college softball? Maybe three? Okay. So the rosters are much bigger for baseball. But they have fewer scholarships. Okay. So it's one of the, it's a tough one because I have a daughter and she plays sports and, you know, I support you guys. You know, if you want to do it in college, it's great. Um, but it comes at the detriment of men as well. Is that fair? I don't know. You decide. Okay. All right. 
in favor of tort reform for uh, for medical malpractice lawsuits. Okay, this one's kind of crazy, guys. Okay, so I was looking up some statistics on this this morning, and um, so what we're talking about medical malpractice is and what tort is. Okay, tort basically means court. Okay, and you have two types of law in this country. You have criminal law, and you have civil law, okay? Criminal's law is when you break the law and you pay consequences for breaking the law. Civil law is when you sue someone, okay? Like, it's between you and me. Civil law, okay? Criminal is between me and the state. You in the state, okay? So we're talking here not about criminal law, but civil law, okay? So you go in, let's say you're 60 years old, you have diabetes, we're in the lockdown, right? And so you're staying in, indoors, you're not going outside, you're trying to avoid people, and so you're stationary, you're not moving a lot, you're just sitting there, you're sitting around watching Netflix, you're not getting any exercise, you get diabetes, you're overweight, and you start to lose feeling in your right foot. Like, it's all going numb. Something's wrong. But you can't go to the doctor because they're only letting COVID people in. Okay, so you wait, you wait, you wait, you finally get into the emergency room because you can't feel anything in your lower extremity. And you get in there and they say, look, you've lost circulation to your foot for so long, it's dead, we're gonna to have to amputate your right foot. So you go in to get your right foot removed for surgery, and then you wake up and you realize they took off your left foot instead of your right foot. The doctor made a mistake. The nurses made a mistake. The hospital made a mistake. And by the way, we're gonna to have to put you through surgery again because we still gotta remove that right foot. So now you come out of surgery with no feet. It's a horror story, isn't it? Okay? Now, you're going to sue. Yes? Who are you suing? You're suing the doctor, the hospital, okay? All right. So for the rest of your life, you have no fee. Now, if we get this lawsuit in front of a jury, and you explain to them all the pain and suffering that you've been through and how you're going to be confined to a wheelchair for the rest of your life and you're going to have to refit your house you're going to have to get a car or a van a van that will be wheelchair accessible this is going to change everything about your life and you're going to sue the doctor in the hospital okay how much money you want How much are we suing them for? Jackson, how much? Now, now I'm going to be able to walk again. A million dollars? Five million dollars? Ten million dollars? All right, let's say we're going to sue them for ten million dollars. Okay? And when during the trial, they call you up on the stand and you break down, you're crying, you got, you know, all this pain and suffering and then all the, you'll never work again, you, you can't do, you'll never play golf again, any of these things, right? So the jury is sympathetic to you and they say, okay, you get $10 million. Now, how's the hospital? And the doctor going to pay for that? Guys, just like when you drive your car, you have insurance. Okay, in case you cause an accident, you have insurance. Yes? So doctors and hospitals have insurance too. It's called liability insurance. It's like your auto insurance. Okay? Because you're liable for this. Okay? So... The insurance company is the one that's paying this. 
ten million dollars. So the insurance company is going to turn around and they're going to start charging the doctor and the hospital more for their insurance premium. Yes. So the doc, I mean, the insurance becomes very expensive for the hospitals and doctors. Yes. So what do the doctors and hospitals have to do to the cost of health care when you come in for a surgery or a checkup or something like that? What happens to the cost of health care for you? It goes up, too, because doctors and hospitals have to charge more because they have to pay the insurance company each month premium. Everybody following me here? Okay. Now, there is no federal cap. On non economic damages, there is a cap of $250,000 on uh, non economic damages, so pain and suffering. You can only get $250,000 for pain and suffering. But as far as the economic damages, like inability to work, having to find a new place to live, or refitting your place to live, or buying, you know, a vehicle and wheelchairs and all that stuff. Okay, there's no cap on that. Okay, so you can see some really big, you know, rewards going to victims here. Follow me? Which drives up the cost of health care. If we can put a cap on the economic damages, okay, in Kansas, the cap, they do have one in Kansas. It's five million. Okay. So max you could get in Kansas is five million two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Okay. Some states don't have caps. And there's no cap at the federal level. So my question to you is would you support caps on the federal level? I mean, can we put a price tag? On these things, okay. Obviously, this would not be allowed in Kansas, ten million. Okay, the most you can get is five. Now, I remember my my in laws used to live in West Virginia, and they had no caps in West Virginia. And doctors were leaving the state because their insurance premiums were so high they couldn't make a profit as a doctor, so they just left West Virginia leaving a shortage of doctors. So, duh, we need to put a cap on things, okay? And we talk about the price of health care in this country. One way to bring it down is to put caps on damages, okay? So there's all types of scenarios, but the worst scenario of all in these cases is wrongful death, okay? You go in for a routine surgery, say a hernia surgery or appendicitis, which is pretty routine surgery, okay? And the hospital administers the wrong drug, and it kills you. So the survivors, I mean, think if this happened to a child, how that would affect the parents, okay? Or if it happened to a single mother, how would it affect the child? Okay, can you put a cap on a human life, okay, and some people have trouble with that, putting a cap on these things. Every case is different, but without caps, the insurance companies don't know how much money they're going to have to dole out, so they're going to have to charge a lot of money for their insurance, which drives up the cost of health care. If you have caps, insurance companies know roughly how many mistakes happen a year just statistically, and they can plan for how much, you know, in a typical year they're going to have to pay out in these types of cases. And they can bring the premiums down, bring the cost of insurance down, therefore bringing the cost of health care down. Hope I explained that well. Okay. Uh, and that is something that is, you know, debated in Congress to this day, um, this issue of medical malpractice. Tort reform, okay? All right? So, um, if you feel like we should put caps, you would say yes. 
if you don't think we should have caps and people should be able to sue for whatever they want, you should say no. Okay? All right. Oil. Guys, for the longest time, this country had to, out of necessity, import oil from the Middle East. We, we, we import oil from Mexico. We import oil from Venezuela. Okay, our nation, guys, uses more energy than any other country in the world, per capita, per individual. We use energy, okay? So that number, 80%, Remember that when we talked about the Green New Deal, 80% of our energy comes from fossil fuel, oil and gas, okay? And so when we talk about, when we look at the map of the United States, we talk about where do we have oil in this country? You guys know which state of all the 50 has the most oil? Oklahoma? Say Oklahoma. It's got some. It's this one. Alaska. Okay. Alaska has a lot of oil. Now, do we get oil from Alaska today? Yes. Okay. Back in the day, okay, back in the day, and uh, it was in the 1950s and 60s, we built a pipeline from Alaska down through the mountains into the United States, into the continental United States, okay? And um, so that oil pipeline is still there, it's still functioning. Most of it is above ground because of the frozen tundra, you know? They had to build it above ground. And they built it, you know, like six to eight feet off the ground. So wildlife can go underneath it. Okay, like the caribou, right? They can go underneath it. In fact, the caribou really like the pipeline because it's warm. <laughs> okay? We, I mean, there's heat that comes from it. Okay? Just from the friction thing, you know, the oil moving through it. Okay. However, in Alaska, there's this area called the Alaska National Wildlife Refuge, which is untouched land. Okay? Like, it's just pristine Alaska. Okay. Well, guys, we've discovered a lot of oil underneath that wildlife zone. Okay. Now, have there been um, accidents with oil? Like, I don't know if you guys ever heard of the Exxon Valdez. You ever hear about that? It was a large cargo ship. I mean, massive cargo ship filled with oil. And it was filling it up in Alaska. And the captain of the ship was drunk, and he ran aground, and the Exxon Valdez started spilling out oil all over the pristine coast of Alaska. Now, obviously, guys, that's going to have a huge big impact on wildlife. So I mean, it's really kind of hard to see. You know, you see seals and birds and dead fish and just you know, like birds covered in oil. You know what I mean? It's, it's kind of kind of tugged at the heartstrings a little bit. And you had thousands of volunteers that went up there, and they went up there with that dish soap, you know, like dove dish soap, and they're up there literally like cleaning birds, getting the oil off, and trying to save them. Okay, it was a horrible accident. Those are pretty few and far between. Okay, and this was human error, you know, drunk captain. God, that guy. I mean, he was. The scum of the earth, you know, I mean, it was, uh, people were all over, okay? But today, guys, we have the ability, when you drill for oil, you can drill straight down. That's the way we always did it, okay? But now they have the ability to drill here, okay, and then do horizontal drilling a mile over there, okay? So the footprint on the, on the surface is small. And you can drill over here a mile, you can drill over there a mile, you can drill over there a mile, and get the oil that way. Okay, so the footprint is very small. Alaska's huge. Okay. Uh, so some people say we should we should we should do that. Okay, we should open up those oil reserves. 
The problem with um, not having oil independence is that you rely on these Middle Eastern countries, which can be, you know, a little crazy sometimes, okay? If there's a war in Nigeria, which also has a lot of oil, okay, if there's unrest in Nigeria, it affects oil prices around the world. If there's a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico, it affects the oil prices around the world. Oil is a worldwide traded commodity based on supply and demand. If there's a threat to that supply, the price goes up. Back in the 1970s, guys, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries called OPEC put an embargo on the United States. And they all agreed, all these countries, oil producing countries, agreed not to give oil to the United States or sell oil to the United States in the 1970s. It sucked. We have an energy crisis. Okay? And so that's when they changed the freaking speed limit to 55 nationally. Everybody had 55. That's the fastest you can drive because it conserves gas when you drive slowly. I'm driving 85, Gulch is more gas. Yes. So, anyhow, um, we started developing more and more uh, oil sources, and then we created something called fracking. Tell me if you know what fracking is. Really? A little bit? Okay, you said Oklahoma. Okay, guys, underneath our feet, not, not in Kansas where we're at right here, but underneath our feet across large parts of the United States. You go to Colorado, huge. North Dakota, huge. Oklahoma, huge. Okay, Texas, huge. Under our feet, there's this rock called oil shale. Okay, and if you drill into that rock, and you send high pressure water with chemicals in it into that rock, it breaks it up and it separates the oil from the rock and you suck that oil out of the ground. Guys, we have enough oil shale under our feet to, to give oil to this country for a, maybe a thousand years. Okay, there is no oil shortage ever again. Okay, so today, uh, for the first time in American history, about two years ago, the United States is completely self-sufficient when it comes to oil. We have enough in this country, we don't have to worry about Saudi Arabia. We don't have to worry about Iraq or Iran. We have enough oil for ourselves. Okay, now, that's called oil security or energy security, which some people say is national security. If you don't have to worry about what's happening over there because you need the oil, then you don't have to go to war over there because of oil. Which is good, okay? Guys, off the coast of uh, the Gulf of Mexico here. I don't know if any of you guys have been to uh, North Florida here, the beaches of the Gulf of Destin. Destin. Fort Walton Beach, Panama City area. Okay. Beautiful beaches. If you ever go to Florida, you couldn't go to the Atlantic side. Okay. It's nice, but the beaches are not near as nice on the Atlantic side as they are on the Gulf of Mexico. Okay. The beaches here are white sand. It's beautiful. Okay. There is oil all across this coastline under the, under the water. You guys remember hearing about the uh, Deepwater Horizon, the BP oil spill? They did a movie. Uh, Mark Wahlberg was in it. Uh, what was that name of the movie? Remember that the oil platform broke and all that oil spilled into the Gulf of Mexico? It's called Deepwater Horizon. Yeah. yeah, this happened, right? So the reason that was so bad is because the oil platform was way out here in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. Because the law says you cannot drill close to the shore. I mean, the number one industry in Florida is tourism. And if you put oil platforms right off the beach, people aren't going to want to go to the beach. So you're not allowed to drill within three miles of the coast. Now, off the coast of Texas, you can. Off the coast of Louisiana, you can. The beaches in Texas and Louisiana are very nice. 
in Florida they are. Okay. So when that broke, it was the fitting, so the drill bit goes all the way down to the sea floor, okay, and there's this thing right there, and that broke at the bottom. And oil started spewing out of the ground. So you got this huge oil slick that's growing, you know, coming up. And it took like a month to shut it off because it was so deep. Okay? If it was in shallower water, you could fix that a lot quicker. Okay? So if you allow drilling at, say, three miles out, if you're laying on the beach in Florida, you're probably going to be able to see the oil platform, but it's going to be about that big. You know, you're laying on the beach. What is that? Oh, it's an oil platform. Okay. And if something happens, they can get to it quicker, so it doesn't destroy the environment. Okay. This gives us more energy security the more we develop. Okay. The more we develop these sources, we don't necessarily have to use them, but Look at gas prices, guys. I mean, $1.95? I mean, it's unbelievable. We, uh, there was a few years ago where we were getting close to $4 a gallon. Okay? Now we don't have to worry about that anymore because we're energy independent. Okay? Which is a national security issue. That's great for us. Okay? So, and yes, we're still using fossil fuels. So, now Joe Biden came out and said he was going to end fracking. Any of you guys feel an earthquake in Kansas? What, the last couple of years? You felt one? Yeah, I did too. I felt one. Uh, it's kind of a trip to ha have an earthquake in Kansas, right? They're originating, originating in Oklahoma, right? We're feeling them up here. And uh, the reason for that, they think, is because of fracking. So they're breaking up that rock. Well, it's going to reset. You know what I mean? And then there's some other byproducts of that, sometimes with groundwater, and that's why we don't do a lot of fracking in Kansas, is we have that Ogala aquifer underneath us. We don't want that those chemicals and the oil to get into our water, drinking water, so, okay? So, in Kansas, it's probably not a good idea, but we have our own oil. I mean, we have oil, just, we don't trace it straight down. You just go to El Dorado, you see the freaking things, right? I mean, that's like 20 miles from my house, okay? I'm like, dude, maybe I have oil in my backyard. You know what I mean? Maybe I should get one of those things. Make some money, okay? Fracking is more expensive than just drilling. And then, guys, we have a ton of natural gas underground in Kansas, okay? Which is what heats most of our homes, okay? You hear the furnace come on? Get a little fire going? It's natural gas, okay? It's cheap, it's clean. Great. Better than wind and solar, definitely more reliable and cheaper. Okay. All right. Next. Uh, so you decide on should we develop these or you're like, hey, you know what? We're all right with fracking. We can do that. Joe Biden said he was going to do away with fracking. Okay. He's changed his tune on that, by the way. Because you know how many jobs would be lost if they stopped fracking? In Oklahoma, Texas, North Dakota, Pennsylvania, Jersey, I mean, all over the country. You're talking about tens, hundreds of thousands of jobs that would be gone. Okay? All right, last one. Okay? This is just a general thought on your, on your part. Okay? Does the U.S. government, is it doing too much to help the American people? When we look at the way the Constitution was written and the role of government, it's fairly limited, okay? But now we have a whole bunch of new programs, okay? So this comes down to things like healthcare, okay? Is the government doing too much? Is the government doing too much when it comes to welfare? These sorts of things, okay? If you want the government more in your life and you want the government to do more to help people, then you would say no to this. Okay, if you feel like the government's doing too much and you want them out of your life, you want lower taxes, you want more freedom, and so forth, you would say yes to this. Okay. Now, what does all that mean? So when 
you're at home tomorrow and you're watching this or Monday, okay, you need to add up your yeses and no's. And then I'm going to explain, depending on how many yeses, where you are on the political spectrum and how many no's, where you are on the political spectrum, okay? Some of you may be in the middle, okay? Some of you may have a bunch of yeses or a bunch of no's, okay? And I'll tell you what it means. But the only way you're going to find out is if you watch the video. Okay? So that's what I'm going to do on Monday with the other half of the class. And then, ladies and gentlemen, uh, when, uh, third Thursday, I guess it would be. Then you'd be here Tuesday, right? Tuesday, I'm going to start with Chapter 1 notes. Okay? I'll probably give you an assignment. Okay? I won't make it due for a few days. I'll give you until, like, the following uh, Sunday night or something. Okay. It'll just probably be vocab. It should take you like less than 30 minutes to do. All right? So I can plan. Hope you enjoyed this to this point, you know, what we did here and learned something from it. And uh, and hopefully you're smarter for it. Okay? That's why I do it. You're a tough crowd. Tough to read. <laughs>